Um, now, as Peter said, I would rather Peter is moderating this uh, panel about driving impact and action where Canada must focus its talent and energies. So rather than me doing it, again, I'm going to get out of the, the, the picture and let Peter take it away uh, because it's a fabulous panel and you will see as Peter introduces them, they've got a pretty solid background. So Peter, all yours as I get out of the picture. Here we go and stop here. There. Thank you again, Bashir. No problem. And, We're waiting uh, Kirsten, I guess Mark is there, fantastic. Okay. Shall I wait a moment, uh, Bashir? Uh, yeah, she she did say she was logging. She was finishing up a call with uh, Davos. So, uh, or you can get started and she can pick it up right away because she would be momentary. She said she was running at eleven forty sharp. So, which it is now. So, hopefully, she'll be there very shortly. I'll keep a lookout for her. Okay, excellent. Well, with that, uh, we're on to the next session. Um, I'm very excited to have been asked to moderate this panel of, of outstanding folks that uh, I'm proud to know in, uh, in every case. But at the same time, I think we're going to hear some really uh, great perspectives from all of them. I'm joined today uh, by four uh, participants in this session. Um, they'll each give you a, a short bio um, and, uh, and, and a little professional synopsis, as, I, as we would say. Um, Ernest Lang, and in order, Ernest Lang, uh, Bruce Croxon, um, Mark Keeley, and Kirsten Stewart, uh, who hopefully will be along shortly with us. Um, for now, I'll just uh, turn it over uh, in that order to, uh, to ask for them to just give a little bit of a professional synopsis. And, uh, and uh, I'll start with you, Ernest, if you could just give me a couple of minutes on where you came from. Actually, you're a little faint, uh, Ernest. Is this better? Um, let us know if you can get that corrected straight up. Otherwise, we can uh, we can move on and uh, uh, see if Bruce could give us a, a 30 second, uh, and then we'll come back to you momentarily. Let's go over to Bruce. Uh, Bruce. Yeah. Hey. Thanks, Peter, and uh, welcome to all my fellow panelists. So, uh, my name is Bruce Crox. I uh, spent the majority of my career uh, on the operating side of things. Um, and uh, I guess the biggest success I had as a tech entrepreneur was with a, uh, collaborating with three other chaps. Uh, we built uh, arguably the first social network in the world <clears throat> called Lava Life. And uh, subsequent to the sale of that company, I, I hung around for a very long two and a half years under the new owners. Uh, and, uh, and acted as CEO for them. Uh, the first time in my career that I've, uh, since I was uh, going through university that I actually worked for somebody and had a boss and reported in, uh, but it was, uh, that was fine. And then the last uh, seven or eight years, I've, I've, I've switched from being an angel investor and focusing on early stage tech to forming Round 13 Capital, which uh, focuses on growth stage technology companies, 99% uh, of which are domiciled here in Canada, uh, because uh, as I've said earlier, I think it's the best place on the planet to start and grow a tech company. And I think we've got the talent, the money starting to flow. So I intend to remain focused on Canada, uh, primarily um, for the rest of my investing career. Thank you, Bruce. And uh, Ernest, how are we doing with your sound? Nope, we're still there. <laughs> still can't, can't get you uh, cued in, but I see Kirsten has arrived. Uh, welcome, Kirsten. Just a quick uh, professional overview would be much appreciated. Thank you, Peter. And hi, everybody. Um, and uh, great to join you here from LA today. Um, but I am a Canadian. I've spent most of my career working with uh, Canadian companies, primarily at the intersection of media and tech. I have been uh, everything from the, uh, for a long time uh, in television distribution. So that means the selling of content globally, which has changed significantly in the last uh, few years, uh, and then moved on to broadcasting where I was, I've been in roles like the, uh, the, the head of um, uh, Hallmark Channels uh, internationally. Um, where I was located here again in the U.S. 
uh, to running the Alliance Atlantis lifestyle channels like HGTV and Food Network back in Toronto, uh, to heading up the, a, a little something called the CBC, uh, which I think we're, you're all familiar with, uh, both the television, radio, and digital uh, entities of, of the CBC. And I worked with folks, uh, talented folks like Bruce here, uh, who, who was on uh, Dragon's Den, one of the shows that we launched when I was there uh, at, at the One CBC. of my favorite bosses, one of my favorite <laughs> all-time bosses right there. <laughs> I, I like to say that I was one of the few people who can claim to be maybe a, a slight, uh, <laughs> have a slight uh, boss role uh, with, with, these, with these great dragons. But uh, uh, Bruce was obviously a fantastic part of that uh, that world uh, and uh, then uh, moved on to start um, uh, the first office for Twitter in Canada uh, started it off with uh, a cell phone a rented Regis office and five people and grew it quite significantly to being the, the fourth biggest revenue generator for Twitter globally um, and then moved down to the states for them where I ran the North American media business out of the New York office with a lot of travel back and forth to, to, to San Francisco, as you can imagine, um, where, where that meant um, heading up the uh, uh, media partnerships. So with folks in uh, entertainment, uh, music, uh, sport uh, and government. Uh, so even, uh, and, and news. So those folks that uh, you're hearing now uh, and the, the discussions going back and forth about who has access to Twitter, that was part of uh, the world that I was working in. Um, and then I came back to Canada to work with a couple of startups. Uh, I wanted to get more into the digital space. So it was a very interesting time working with uh, both Tribal Scale and Diply for a while. Um, and uh, then the World Economic Forum came calling. Uh, and so I've it was an opportunity to step back into the intersection of media and technology. So at the forum, which is largely known for Davos that we hold once a year uh, in January, and actually we're doing a virtual version of it next week um, with, an, with an upcoming version, hopefully in Singapore at the end of May uh, in person. Um, we, um, uh, I am heading up the media uh, d division there. So that uh, re requires or is the opportunity to work with uh, members uh, for the, of the forum uh, who are in the media and technology business. So everyone from Facebook, Google, ByteDance, um, it's, they're all global companies, there's about 40 odd of them. And uh, we looked at the future of media and what that looks like. Um, and uh, so I'm looking forward to the conversation today and talking about Canada's role in that feature. Me too. <laughs> Ernest, are we there? Oh, darn. <laughs> so that still can't get you. So over to Mr. Mark Keeley. Thanks for joining us today, Mark. <laughs> love to hear a little bit about your background. Everyone would love to hear. Oh, Mark, you're on mute. I can see that on the screen. There we go. Can you hear me? There you go. Sorry, I, thank I you. Thank you. That's thank the line you. of the year. You know, you're isn't on that, yeah, I just hate that. <laughs> I'd be so stupid not to unmute. But thanks to Bashir for inviting me. And uh, it's good to see you and Bruce. Uh, Peter, just uh, quickly, uh, my name is Mark Keeley, and I'm very, very delighted to be here and welcome everybody for attending. Uh, our firm, k &A, Inc., is a, a national firm, but we're also, we have global context in what we're doing. We're experts here in, in governance uh, and government and public wow. policy, and we've done an awful lot of work, not only here in Canada, uh, but uh, globally, uh, Asia, South America, and Europe, as well as Latin America. But I think uh, apropos to this conversation today, uh, Peter, we believe firmly here in a unique selling proposition sure. that is Canada. Uh, yeah. We've honed uh, sure. really good skills in this country, like Bruce to, uh, to suggest that we're uh, sure. a very, very enviable spot, uh, internationally to be doing what we're doing. And I'm anxious to have this conversation. I, uh, I'm, I'm lucky that I, I learned my politics at the feet of probably one of the most iconic politicians in Canada, John Turner. Um, everybody uh, who, whom, uh, who, whom I know across Canada would agree with me. And I think it's really important too, based on the unique selling proposition, my second mentor was uh, Abdul Kalam, former president of India. So I'd like to talk about how Canada and India have a, have a wonderful opportunity to coexist and to collaborate on issues that we'd probably talk about today. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Mark. And uh, Ernest, do we have you now? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Oh, great. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, probably won't surprise anybody who watched this, but I am not in technology and I'm definitely not an audio engineer. Um, but um, Professionally, basically what I've done uh, a, a number of years ago, I formed a, 
a, a, essentially an entrepreneurial co-op of finance and uh, investment professionals uh, at, called Promerita Group, where we connect people, capital, and opportunity. We have three basic lines of business. We invest debt and equity in operating businesses and a wide range of real estate assets uh, with a focus in non-luxury housing. And we also provide advisory services to, financial, to the financial services sector, private business families, and financing advice to the real estate industry and operating companies. But I think more relevantly uh, in terms of my participation in this uh, summit is not so much my business background, but my personal background. So I was born in Singapore and became a Canadian at age two. Uh, when my parents immigrated to Canada, uh, we moved to North Vancouver in 1976 when Pierre Trudeau was prime minister of the country. Um, fundamentally, we were attracted by the Canadian promise to be able to build our lives uh, in the future uh, in a country that promised peace, order, and good government. And our family was definitely at the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder coming to Canada because at the time, Singapore, even though my parents were doing well in Singapore, they were young, and Singapore was a relatively poor country, certainly very poor compared to Canada. So our first home was on a street in North Vancouver, which was the closest residential street to the community dump yard in North Van. My earliest memories going to the Vancouver flea market uh, uh, were my earliest business memories, quote unquote business memories, would be of going to the Vancouver flea market on the weekends and hoping that my parents would sell enough during the weekend from their 12 by 14 foot blue tarp so that my mother wouldn't be too stressed when she went grocery shopping. It was a time in my life that if I knew that my mom came home with a bag of grapes from the Sunrise Market in Chinatown, it was because they were close to being thrown out. Now, in those days, no one had yet coined the term household food insecurity, but that did not mean it didn't exist. So I would say a sense of financial insecurity was a big part of my life growing up. And this increased a lot when I was seven, when my father was diagnosed with leukemia and he was a self-employed realtor. So he didn't have any things like disability benefits. Uh, and my most vivid memories were from age seven onwards was driving with my mom to the Shaughnessy Hospital where my dad would get his chemotherapy treatments and where he would stay when he was bedridden by his cancer. Those, uh, those car rides ended when I was 10 because he died. He was 38 years old and my mom was, was left as a, young as a young widow to care for me and my two younger siblings who were eight and two at the time, along with her own mother, my grandmother, who now lives with us and is turning 94 next month. And because my mother was an only child, she had no other siblings to help care for her, uh, care for our family and look after the struggling family business that had started off on the 12 by 14 foot blue tarp. So with that degree of ongoing chronic stress, it probably wouldn't surprise you that uh, 10 years after my dad died, my mother was diagnosed with uh, lymphoma uh, when she was in her forties. And although we had more years with her than we had with my dad, she also ended up dying uh, much too young. So that's why for me, the promise of Canada that we can live in a society in a nation of peace, order, and good government is very attractive. So this combination in my business, this combination of my business background and growing with a lot of financial insecurity uh, also led to me being, you know, having a very strong pragmatic streak. Um, I, I believe in less talk and more action. And also having a primary identity as an orphan, I personally identify more easily with Canadians who are marginalized and who face economic insecurities than uh, you know, people who, who to go to um, Florida golf clubs you know, as a big part of their post-retirement plan. However, be because of the arc of my life includes both half price grapes and today where I, I feel comfortable ordering dessert anytime we go out for dinner, frankly, I have a really high baseline feeling of gratitude and optimism. And that has really been a big gift for me, uh, both in terms of my personal happiness and it's also led, uh, contributed to my confidence to pursue various business opportunities as, as they have arisen. Because in my experience, things have generally worked out. So basically, I, I always believe that things have the potential to get better I have this underlying optimism that things can get better with good planning, thoughtfulness, and frankly, you know, in the theme of the summit, collaboration. 
there's always a solution and a positive path forward. So that's a great uh, cue, yeah. Ernest. Thank you for uh, for that, and and certainly this being all about collaboration, um, a great uh, step off into some questions that we have for for each of you, and uh, allow me to sort of go around the room and, and get everybody involved here in uh, in weighing in on this theme of of collaboration. So um, I'm I'm going to start by you know we're all here for. Uh, for you know, how can we see collaboration? How can we think about collaboration as something that matters more now than perhaps uh, at, any at any time in, in history, at least uh, in my lifetime? It's a meaty term, lots of possible definitions for collaboration. But I would ask, and I'm gonna go to Kirsten first, uh, how would you define collaboration? And in your area specifically, what's the best example of Canadian collaboration you've seen and what was great about it? Sure. And, you know, it's interesting because having worked now outside of uh, Canada for the last couple of years, it's been, you know, it's always interesting as someone who is a Canadian working globally to look back at Canada and see it as such a great example of a country that understands the value of collaboration, also because of the unique position of Canada. Canada is a certain size and scale that it kind of requires to play the role of, of a collaborator or a convener because it, 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 can, it can easily play that role and also get involved in some very uh, top level and, and, and important conversations. And I think, you know, our, our nature, our culture leads us to a very collaborative nature. Uh, I think, you know, what I've learned in the last couple of years at the World Economic Forum particularly is, you know, this, the, the very nature of the organization is to sit at the center of public and private cooperation is, is what we define it as. And the best conversations that we have and looking at how to improve the future state of the world happen when you get business leaders, uh, heads of state, uh, academia, uh, public policymakers, uh, those that are uh, involved in, in social uh, justice um, campaigns and initiatives together uh, to have these, to, to, to bring the different perspectives that can actually move the needle forward in in terms of real practical solutions. And I think, you know, when you, when you talk from a specific um, uh, perspective that is your own uh, and without the opportunity to learn from others, you know, this is, a, is, is not just an opportunity for collaboration in, in, in kind of a uh, checking off the box kind of sense. This is an actual in-depth opportunity to exchange ideas in a setting that provides an opportunity for uh, collaboration and it actually stresses the importance of collaboration. And so, when you see, you know, Canada has had a, a, such a long history, whether it's you know the establishment of NATO and you know the the, the the huge you know moves that Canada has made on the world scale, considering we punch way above our weight in terms of of size and and uh, scale, it, it, we do that through collaboration. And I think you know the one thing that I've seen at the forum is the is the importance of Canada's role. Currently, uh, as an example, as I said at the top, I'm working in the media sector, and a lot of what we're talking about right now is the challenges that the world is finding. You know, it's been exacerbated by things like the American election, which really pointed out the challenges of disinformation and and the 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 validity of truth. What is truth nowadays? What 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 is fact? Uh, and I think you know the platform's role, media's role. You know, Canada is also playing an important role in that in a, in a campaign and a, in a group uh, that has been started by the Canadian government uh, and together with, again, other governments and, and other uh, platforms and leaders to focus on what is, the, what is the role of media in that disinformation and has taken actually a leadership position in a lot of the decisions that it's made around how to work together with platforms and making sure that that information is, is true and verified. And I think you know, that, that's a great position for Canada to take um, in that you know, ability to be able to, to sit as a convener, but also as thought leadership in that kind of role. And you know, we've, we've looked at uh, the, you know, the, 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 the various concerns that people have around what disinformation campaigns have done to kind of destabilize uh, not just governments, but business. And the fact that even in B2B roles, there's a, lot, there's a lack of trust now that we have a pandemic and we have, you know, the challenges of, of people believing in the vaccine and the veracity of it and the, and the, and the health of it. Uh, it's, you know, these are all things that are a huge uh, importance as we try to move through the pandemic and into a recovery position. So Canada has been and will continue to play an important role there. 
my view as someone who's working globally is to look back at you know Canada's role and I know I know how important it is and I think it's 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 in our nature it's in our culture and it's and it's in the way that we work and it's a great way to leverage our size and a global mm -hmm. scale certainly reason for hope as we're all about Canada here today and and the role we can play and and connecting that to global agendas Bruce I'm going to go over to you for a minute with the with the same question What's the best example of collaboration you've seen and what was great about it? Give me a couple of minutes from your perspective. Yeah, sure. And just, just quickly echoing uh, what Kirsten's saying, I'm glad she's on it because to me, it's the issue of our time. You know, the whole dissemination, dissemination of truth and, you know, who's responsible for what goes out on what media platform. So you know, good to hear we have our best and brightest uh, trying to tackle the problem. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm heavily biased when it comes to the topic of collaboration. I've never done anything as an entrepreneur on my own. Um, being an entrepreneur can be a very lonely endeavor. I decided early on that there was enough that I didn't know that I needed uh, bright, smart people around me uh, that brought things to the table that I didn't have. Uh, and I, I, I consider that a, a blessing um, that I was able to identify early what my weaknesses were and then augment them. So I think it's almost like a, a critical aspect of defining collaboration uh, that you need to separate self-interest uh, and ego um, from the conversation uh, when you're collaborating and trying to arrive at a, a mutually beneficial solution, or at least have them on the table that when you're giving a point of view, uh, you know that there's a self-interest behind it so that the rest of your partners or people trying to arrive at a decision can take the bias into account. So the best example in Canada, uh, you know, and again, I just should quickly add that in technology, the backdrop is things are moving just so quickly and so much more quickly than they did when I started in tech 20 years ago. That if you do see people coming through the door that claim to have all the answers, uh, it, 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 it's a warning shot because those people are increasingly rare with the amount of data and information that's coming at us on a minute by minute basis. Um, so with all that said, you know, I think that um, the tech ecosystem in Canada in cooperation with the federal government, I think has been a good example of what uh, government and business can do uh, working together. And I'll give a couple of examples. One was when uh, it became increasingly apparent south of the border that immigrants weren't gonna be as welcome uh, in the US uh, as they once had been, the beacon of, of the land of the free. What a, what a crock of shit, right? When Trump got in. Um, and you know, we turned immediately and made it easier for people to show up uh, on our shores. And I can't tell you the number of first generation Canadians that walk into my office uh, with ambition and a plan and a hunger and a drive and the smarts uh, to make things happen. Um, so thankful for that uh, a, a, as, a, as an example. And I think also the funding of early and growth stage companies, I think has finally got to the point where we're doing the right thing uh, in getting capital into the hands of, of companies that are deserving. We need to do better at making sure companies that shouldn't get funded don't end up with a lot of of, of dollars because that sends the wrong message and builds the wrong type of ecosystem. But we'll work that out over time. I'm optimistic we'll get it. And again, you know, let's just keep collaborating as we head into the next, collaborating as we head into the next stage that we're going to have to face, right, of the money that we've spent and where is the payback going to come from? It can't continue forever. Let's work together to figure out how we continue to be fiscally responsible in such a great country. We need capital. We can't keep this kind of deficit going, but where is it going to come from? And let's make sure it doesn't come from the people that are creating the jobs that are, that are, you know, continuing to swing above our weight on the world stage and create world-class technology companies. My bias in the collaborative argument, got to declare it. I don't, I don't want it to come from the, entrepreneurs, the small business people, the people that are job creating. I'm biased, but I think I have some fact and momentum to back myself up. Uh, I'll certainly vouch for that. <laughs> and then, and in the collaboration between government and, and business specifically, as you called out immigration, but 
you know, you, you define compromise beautifully when you said uh, separate self-interest from ego. And uh, I think, you know, those are very important foundational thoughts for all of us uh, at the basis of any great relationship is, is respect and compromise. Um, Mark, um, over to you for a moment, as I've got to know you, obviously, and you've taught me so much about the gap in collaboration between government and business, and also with many, many examples, I'm sure over your lifetime, advising a prime minister as long as you did, and, and the things I know you've, you've taught me over the years, I would love to hear your thoughts about how we could do better, um, specifically weighing in on Bruce's point about uh, collaboration between government and business. You know, um, it's interesting you, you call it a gap. And I, I think a lot of people um, who, who are in business probably tend to think that government should be there de facto to help them, when in fact, they probably don't speak the language of government. And that's a real uh, issue that I think is, uh, is really hurting the relationship between government and, and, uh, and business, private business, private sector per se. We have a great look at, I'm going to say this uh, very candidly and very bullishly, Canada is not punching above its weight. Canada is a big player in the global stage and has been for over 100 years. You know, when you look at what Canada has done after World War I, it was, it's logical that the Yalta Conference said Canada is going to be a part of this, what, what turned out to be the G7. We're an extraordinarily uh, smart people. We're resilient. And the resilience that we have is a unique selling proposition for Canada and helps us as, as people to be really good in terms of collaboration. Governments are not leading. They never lead. Governments always follow and they always enable. And so we've got to look at how we work with governments now to do kind of the protective things. Even if you look at a, uh, this pandemic world we're in right now, all of these material events are happening. And we got to look at how we create some kind of a, leverageability. And the way you can do that is through legislative uh, of efforts, and people need to understand how that works. In Canada, I think we've got two really good unique selling propositions. Number one is the manner in which we've become resilient. And, and there are myriad examples of that. And the second is on governance. And I think we've been really, really good in this country on putting forward the best practices for governance. And that's having an impact I think internationally. I'll use this as one very classic example, Peter. If you look at, at uh, Canada is the leading nation on planet Earth right now for cannabis. And whether you like it or not, it, it's inconsequential. But the, the issue is we've created a system. We've created a series of national regulations that makes it the envy of the world. And there are so many things that could cascade down from that with collaboration with government so that private sector can do well, not only to create the best science, but to, to uh, impact on things like machine learning and uh, to continue down the path on, on good oversight and governance. And that, those are the things that are the hallmarks of Canada going forward. Thank you, Mark. And that good oversight and governance, I know, you know every day we wish that we could do better, um, but at the same time, it's a tall order. Collaboration is, is uh, not an easy thing when you're talking about government and business. Um, can I just yeah. add one more thing, Peter? Sure. It's Absolutely. And, and I don't want to, to gear the conversation, but one of the other unique uh, issues that Canada has is the marriage of truth and reconciliation with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. That will fundamentally shift the way this country operates on four levels. You've got the federal government, provincial government, municipal governments, and the First Nations. And I really think we need to exploit that from a business perspective, too. Thanks, Mark, and certainly uh, an elusive issue, at least in my entire lifetime, um, thinking about the origins of this country and, and how we resolve you know, collaboration, which seems sometimes unreachable, unreachable, but putting all those other layers in tells us what a tall order it is. So anyone who's attempting that ought to be embraced. Um, on, on the term of good governance, and, and Ernest, uh, you know, I remember having a conversation with you about some of your uh, achievements uh, in Western Canada, uh, which uh, in some ways might have seemed against all odds in terms of a government that may not identify completely with uh, some of the views that, that are attributed to business or free enterprise or, or uh, you know, uh, any of the right-wing, left-wing arguments that, that, we, that, that persist here in this country. And yet you've been quite successful um, in engaging government um, specifically as an investor to address um, significant housing issues. Can you give me an example in just a couple of minutes here, give me the headline on how that happened, if you can share it with us, 
um, and a little bit quickly on what it was that uh, that that came about uh, for you and your firm and your opportunity to collaborate with government. Sure. Uh, thanks, Peter. So I just to give people a bit of context, I'm sitting in my office here on Pender and Seymour. If I walk 12 minutes west, roughly on about 12 minutes walking, I will get to the building where last year, I think it was last year, there was a condo that was listed for sale for $58 million, okay? And then if I walk 12 minutes east of my office, I will be at Maine and Hastings, which is the heart of the poorest postal code in Canada. And so that's, that, that is the world in which I live. I, I, I move from, from 12 minutes west to 12 minutes east. The, the one thing I have uh, seen that has emerged, I think, from this pandemic is a re realization that the nature of leadership has to change. We, good, there's a difference between effective leadership and good leadership. And good leadership involves leading for something that's beyond your own narrow interests, whether it's partisan interests or personal interests or a, sort of a segment of society's interest. So one of the things that I've seen is um, through this pandemic, we, we uh, took, took over three properties uh, in the Strathcona area, which is the area that the downtown east side is located. So I can walk 15 minutes from my office and get to these properties. And essentially what I've seen is the provincial government, which is an NDP government through BC Housing and the city of Vancouver, which has uh, been bedeviled essentially by a housing crisis for, um, for many, many years. So to come together and start a conversation about uh, working together with my firm and also another uh, major development company, uh, a Canadian development company that's headquartered in Vancouver. To the vision is to transfer a property to a not-for-profit to create a, a significant number of non-market uh, seniors housing and also to create hundreds of moderate market housing. Because one of the things that we've seen is some of the policies uh, that are very well intended that have been put in place to try to address the housing issue. What they've done is they've turned, you know, $8 million mansions into $6 million mansions, which for better or for worse, doesn't really impact the options available for 99% of Canadians. So I think um, one thing that's good is I think uh, Canadians in general uh, are humble enough to learn and say, wait a second, maybe that didn't work. We should try something better. And, and, and hope, hopefully that, that level of pragmatism continues at all levels of government and among all leaders. Uh, if we can get our ego out of, the, out of the way and our own personal ideology and narrow, uh, narrow interests put that aside and sort of focus on the big picture and take a pragmatic approach. Um, I think there's uh, a lot that can be done in many industries, not just in housing. Um, as a, but, but I think there, the housing issue is actually relevant to the overall business and technology issue because in the new, in the new economy, I think uh, all of the technology entrepreneurs would agree. The most important factor is actually people. You wanna have the best and brightest. Um, on your team to build the new economy. But the best and brightest people, you know, there's an old saying, people don't quit a job, they quit a boss. So conversely, the best and brightest are attracted to leaders that um, are the best and brightest as well. So I think there's an important discussion that needs to be had in the themes of collaboration because leadership involves a unity and catalyzing and encouraging collaboration amongst the best and brightest. So I think there's a question about, are, are we, um, are we um, encouraging the right type of leadership culture, both in industry, as well as in the political leadership and public service? You know, I do have questions about that. 
well, certainly, Ernest, the, 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 some inspiration that uh, we're seeing two levels of government and private business mm -hmm. large and, and what you've created in an entrepreneurial way, working together to address what is certainly a, a significant crisis, including during the pandemic for housing, uh, inability to pay rent, et cetera. COVID itself, right, is a collaboration moment for us, whether it's development or it's how we uh, access infrastructure services, uh, you know, pay when we've lost our jobs. Um, I'm going to flip back over to Mark for a moment, obviously watching many, many governments and, and thinking about um, how we deal with this pandemic and what to expect for the future. And, and, and what I'm going to do, you know, post your, uh, and I'll give you a couple of minutes just to give us, a, you know, your, your quick thoughts on that. And then I'm going to go and have everybody score Canada quickly on how we're doing, uh, you know, against that once they, you, you set that up or frame that up for them. Well, before, before I do that, I'm going to probably defer to Kirsten in terms of, of how we've been graded as a country, given what we saw to the south of us. And, you know, I, I got to say, um, we're really lucky because uh, when you look at how the prime minister performed and how each of the premiers performed in Canada, at least over the course of the last year, they were all graded against how Washington managed it, and some uh, and some would say that it was just a pathetic show. Uh, it was a it was a terrible show, and so by by extension, I think it, nothing could be uh, could be worse than what we saw in in uh, the United States, especially with the last administration. But having said that, too, I think there's an awful long way uh, for us to go. Canada did a, a superb job in managing right out of the gate that people needed to. Uh, we needed to control this, but we needed to make sure that if people were going to be uh, in a position to have this control, they had to be paid if they weren't, they weren't going to be working. And I think uh, industry was well taken care of. Uh, society was well taken care of through some of the programs that the government moved uh, fast to get in place. I think that there, if, if one, somebody was to say to me, how would you grade government by, um, uh, you know, in terms of, of did they manage business correctly? Nobody knew the impact of this. We're learning every day uh, new issues. We're learning the, the uh, insidiousness of this virus. And now we're, we're faced with variant factors for this as well. So we don't, we're not out of the woods yet. And we certainly don't know what's gonna happen even next week. Um, those who are in public health should be in a position to give us very good advice. Those who are in government should heed that advice and put good uh, legislative um, uh, platforms in place to guide us that way. And I think that industry needs to be, and people too, need to be a little more patient with this, but at the same time, a lot more um, vigilant around this. We, th this is, yes, the, 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 the uh, Spanish flu of 1918 went on for three years. And so we're only, we're not even a year in on this yet. And uh, people are still saying, I'm tired. I, I, you know, I, wanna, I wanna do what I wanna do. So we need to, I, I think we really need to take a, a, a collective look at this in the context of, of what we do to manage this, not only here in Canada, but globally. But having said that too, Peter, and I think this is where we could get uh, a little bit of a spanking as a country. I think what we need to, Canada always rests on its laurels. And I think we have a bit of a, and I'm gonna get criticized for this. We have a bit of a superiority complex when it comes to things. And I think we need to address that. And I think we need to, and that comes, that, that starts with uh, the manner in which we put people in place to govern us. Uh, I don't believe that people are a, a, a political class. I think people govern people and we put people in place who really sort of set the culture for us. That's what I believe. And frankly, uh, I think we, we need to do a better job of putting in place uh, at the national level programs that cascade down to provincial and municipal levels like investment in things like innovative medicines. And that would be putting us in a position right now so that we wouldn't be uh, scrambling for vaccines in Canada. I know that's going to get people criticizing me, but I think it's real true. And uh, it's really true. And so from that perspective, I think we need the, the, the business sector, the private sector needs to be a little more intellectually honest and tougher and assertive when it comes to government and not be so quick to say, I need you to be nice to me so that I can still have a meeting with you as government, because that really is the reality we're up against right now. Thanks, Mark. And, and it's always appreciated to all of the uh, participants here when you step out just a little bit and, 
and tell us, you know, really what you think, despite it may, its popularity maybe not being right up at the top. That's what uh, we were all asked to do here was provide a candid, unfiltered view of things. And thank you for that. And again, uh, I admire those uh, perspectives and have benefited from them myself in, in terms of not really knowing how to speak the language and, and, and sometimes being frustrated with, with the action or inaction that we see and wanting only for the best for the country, which I know is where everybody's coming from here. And Kirsten, I'm gonna to go to you. Uh, obviously in your role, you see all sorts of things. And, and the question was, you know, what do you give us out of 10? Um, how are we viewed out there? Um, you know, one to 10. Um, and, and let me just bookend that and say, five years ago from your own travels to today, up, down, flat, out of 10, over to you. Well, I think, I think Mark puts it well when he says that we're often graded against our neighbors um, when it comes to you know, our performance globally as global citizens, as, as, as players uh, in, in any kind of context. Um, and I think you know, given uh, the challenges of the last uh, US administration, now that we've transitioned to a new US administration, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how we maintain that position, but I think we've still been considered to be, you know, globally seen as, you know, very important and, and leaders. And, you know, as, as, as Mark had, has well pointed out, you know, there's a resilience factor in here and, you know, there's a resilience of, of Canada based on the fact that we have a, a, a very strong basis and a very strong health system that we were able to build upon. Um, but we also do have challenges, I think, that were unearthed during this uh, pandemic as a country when it came to, you know, the, showing the cracks of the socioeconomic uh, challenges that, uh, that we're now seeing. And I'm sure Ertz can talk a bit uh, to that as well, um, because we're, we're now seeing, I think, some blemishes and some challenges and, and some real, real systemic problems that we need to fix uh, as a country that had been exacerbated by the challenges of this, of this pandemic. But you know, it's interesting. It's the it's the it's the constant paradox when it comes to Canada. I think as Canadians, we you know we we grade ourselves very harshly um, on the global scale. I think the the paradoxes were seen you know to be quite uh, to, to to perform quite well, um, and that's a good thing. Uh, and I think it's because you know it's good that we're humble enough to to hold ourselves to to a higher standard. Uh, but even you know, just I think it was yesterday, Merkel was saying that uh, in 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 Germany, you know, she's getting complaints from from her, from her you know German colleagues that they're not doing as well as Canada is. So there is a perception that you know Canada, and it's an earned perception on many levels that Canada has done quite well through this pandemic and managed it again because we had a good basis of a good health system to start with, and the and as Mark points out, a good uh, a good habit of of or a good tradition of listening to to health. Uh, experts and and government clearing the way or at least preparing the the, the fields for for them to to, uh, to to do to do the good work that they need to do but i think you know canada has been seen very much as a as a leader uh, through this pandemic you know we we have a we have a resilience um, you know, I, it's interesting you know, the, the, it kind of speaks to this larger question of of our own internal perception where we tend to be hard on ourselves and the global perception which seems to you know always paint us you know sometimes we don't like the, the perception because we get painted as 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 uh, friendly mounties on uh, on horseback uh, and uh, you know and and you know and and very sweet and you know and light and, and nice people and which is great and i think we do have a lot of we do have a lot of obviously great uh, characteristics and qualities canadians and we export those when we when we move globally um, but you know, there's also you know we, we tend to be very harsh on ourselves. And when and another reminder I had just yesterday was I'm part of um, you know, speaking on the on the media side. I'm part of a uh, steering committee on sustainability of uh, journalism, which is obviously you know there's a huge challenge right now, as we talked about at the top, with the, the, the what what is truth today and and what is trust in in media. And they pointed out Canada as the as one of the high marks. Uh, you know, the the and interestingly, it's the 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 investment of the Canadian government in journalism, which just happened over the last year or so, um, that internally in Canada is seen as hugely problematic. Um, is actually seen as a as a beacon and and as a highlight to, for those external to to Canada. So you know sometimes we you know our own perception of what we are doing internally because you know we we understand the depths of the of the challenge of being a Canadian. There's a quandary of being Canadian often. Um, it, globally, um, it's it, you know we get higher marks, and so you know I think as much as we're defined against the ac actions of of the US, um, those you know, actions will obviously change with this new administration. 
uh, hopefully we'll maintain that high mark moving forward. But globally, we're seen to be performing really, really quite well. Uh, and, and I think in that way, when I talk about punching above our weight, I think that's where we seem to be punching above our weight. Kirsten, an and important perspective, obviously, with what um, you've seen firsthand, countries of the world coming together, business leaders, CEOs who are trying to address what are the issues of the day and how can we solve for that when there's very little collaboration, as we've seen during this pandemic from country to country and from level of government to level of government. Um, Bruce, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to you. And, and we've got uh, that little 15 minutes to go here. So I've uh, been a lot of great conversation, a lot of good introspective thought. And uh, I'm going to go over to you, Bruce, to, to talk about how um, you think entrepreneurs and government can come together during this pandemic. And I'll guide you a little bit on this. Um, when you think about this vast country and distributing a vaccine, you know, I, I would personally say it's an unfair comparison to compare that, for example, to Israel with many few, fewer logistics challenges and maybe even the levels of government and the complexity that we have here, which in part uh, were, were, were spawned based on different regional differences. We talked about Alberta earlier. We talked about indigenous peoples. Can you think of a way that entrepreneurs and government can work together better now uh, in order to help us along in this pandemic? Maybe it's disinformation, maybe it's logistics, maybe it's somewhere in between. Over to you. Well, I mean, only partially tongue in cheek. I'd start with a, a course on uh, sales uh, on sales 101 as you're trying to convince Pfizer and the pharmaceutical companies to say, hey, how about us? I mean, what I've the little I've read, you know, the Israelis, part of the reason that they got off to such a screaming start is that Netanyahu, Netanyahu was on the phone to the CEO of Pfizer 27 times a day until they got their supply you know, the, the uh, squeaky wheel. So, you know, at the beginning it was, well, we have the supply and, and the, the distribution channels aren't, aren't ready to go, but now I'm, I'm understanding that that's not the case. So, I mean, keeping on top of all this stuff is, 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 is not my full-time job, uh, Peter, but, uh, you know, the data, when we get the time to look back on it, you know, doesn't lie and it, and it, does, it does tell a story. Um, uh, and I think one of the things that, we could do a lot better. And don't get me wrong, I think everybody is incredibly well intentioned. We, one of the, 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 the things that, you know, the easiest way to tell the difference between a Canadian and, Amer and an American is when you start to talk about patriotism and the blind patriotism that comes with, you know, that's created a lot of the problems, I think, south of the border, which I, I don't think we suffered to uh, anywhere near the same degree, unless you're talking about our hockey team when it takes to the ice, you know, against other countries, but that's you know, one little area. So the to me, the data doesn't lie. I mean, it, it's impossible to grade us right now because the data is still coming in. But I will say that if we had the energy and time to do more subs, you know, uh, to create more subsections on how on who this virus is hurting, when and how, I think we would have done some things differently rather than take a blanket approach whether that be federally or more likely provincially to say, everybody shut down in these sectors, uh, these sectors are okay. I mean, I think it could have been a lot more finely done. You do have entrepreneurs that do have logistics, uh, incredible examples of logistics execution, holding up their hands now and saying, listen, when we get the supply, um, you know, call on us, let's put a little task force together to, to, to use the best uh, brains on how to get this distributed efficiently. Um, I mean, people have done this for a living. So I, I have no idea as we sit today, whether the government is, is, is listening and, to, and, and is ready to take advantage of, of some of the entrepreneurs that uh, built businesses on distribution networks and, and getting things uh, out in an efficient manner. But obviously I would just encourage that level of cooperation and collaboration to do so historically it's been if you make a, a, enough noise and prove that you've got enough constituents behind you to be able to sit down and get an audience, then we've had we've had experience of being listened to, Peter. You know, on on, on the example of of tax and small business, uh, how you I mean, this is a this is obviously a very serious issue. Lives are at stake. Getting back on track, getting the machine rolling again is at stake. My hope would be that that would be enough. Uh, for the governments to take the extra step of tapping into the uh, the help that's being offered. 
Thank you, Bruce. And uh, I remember it well, summer of 2017, and with some support uh, around the table, we were able to do our best to stumble around and say, we think there's, there's, there's possibly a better way if we, if we work together. So I'm encouraged. And, and even watching uh, Toby Lutke with the, his uh, COVID app and uh, the selfless effort uh, that his company made to give us that awareness and, and you and I firing that around saying, get on this thing. And with all the disinformation, you know, we were fighting walls of, 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 of resistance that should have come from, you know, come at another time, not in the time of crisis. But in any event, I, I, I appreciate those comments and, and, uh, and do truly believe that, you know, solving that gap between government and business and between business and the people is all about having a common thing to focus on. If we don't have it now, we're never going to have it. So let's hope that uh, there are blue skies ahead. Um, with the 10 minutes we have left, um, I'm going to give you each a, a minute and, and then a little bit of a summary time at the end. Um, and I'll go to you first, Ernest. Leaving today's conference or, or summit, what is the one initiative, program, or area that you are going to be paying most attention to, either inside Canada or outside, that you think will have the most impact in the next 12 to 24 months? Thanks, Peter. Do you mind if I just uh, speak to a number of things that I heard from the panelists in the last, to your last question? Let's see if we have some time to sum up at the end. Okay. I want to make sure we get this question and get, get, get to everyone and give everybody a minute and then we'll see what we got at the end. But so tell me, what is that one thing you think will have the most significant impact and that you'll take away from today's conference? And maybe that's a nice way to connect to what you've heard here from the others. So, so uh, in the short term, like in the immediate term, uh, certainly the, the vaccine procurement and distribution issue will be, uh, I think, impactful for many, all countries. Um, and to sort of tie to some of the things that I heard, one of the things that I, uh, uh, you were asking, like how we, I don't think you asked me if, if yeah, you didn't ask me to, to grade how Canada is doing on the collaboration scale. Um, we have to be careful as Canadians that we don't uh, just form our views based on the echo chamber that we often find ourselves in. And um, I, I'm somebody who reads everything from the Taiyi, which is quite a left-wing uh, local uh, publication to the, the, uh, the, the National Review, you know, which would be a, a very uh, conservative uh, publication. And the thing I've, I've I realized as Canadians, I think there is a global universal consensus that we are very well-intentioned we're very decent and we're a moderate people. But I think we have a couple of blind spots when we think about these kind of issues. The two biggest blind spots that I see is we tend to pick and choose who we compare ourselves to. So even in, ter in, in, even in terms of this, uh, there's been a sentiment that, oh, we've done pretty well. Yeah, we have done well compared to the US. But if you take a look at the uh, top five countries that have uh, done well through this, uh, and I've had conversations with others, uh, they include New Zealand, Iceland, Singapore, um, and Vietnam. And when I speak to other Canadians, uh, they say, well, these are all small, uh, small countries that are islands. I said, yes, except for Vietnam. Vietnam is a poor country. It's not an island. And there are 100 million people. Okay. So why are we not comparing ourselves to them? You know? Um, so we have a tendency. We, we, we go through a lot of effort. And we go through a lot of hand waving and we go through a lot of rhetoric to achieve, I would say, often mediocre to mediocre and slightly better results. We what would really, be the one thing you would, what would be the one thing that you'd be watching, Ernest, 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 to say going forward? Let's pick the Canadian government. What is it that you believe they need to pay attention to? First and foremost, I'll give you 10 seconds. I want to make sure I get everybody in here. Okay. The question is they have to, are they leading for their partisan interests or certain uh, uh, preferred segments of Canadian society or are they leading for Canada? Well done. So, okay. you know, let's put the partisan issues aside and let's let's be for Canada. And when it comes to the pandemic and obviously are dealing with it uh, here, here, um, I'm gonna go over to you, Kirsten, and ask you, what is the one thing that you take away here that you believe we should be paying attention to either inside Canada or outside over the next 12 to 24 months. Sure, and I think it, you know this is a challenge globally, but it's one that affects Canada as part of the that global media ecosystem, which is you know post COVID, we're gonna we're living in a post factual world. 
uh, and uh, post post administration in the U.S. and and other factors. You know, we have an opportunity to kind of uh, look at what what brought us to this state of where we have such a lack. Currently, the media eco- ecosystem is as an industry viewed as the least trusted industry. Uh, of any of any of any industry that it's never it's always scored lowly, but it's never scored as low as it has, and that's a that's an issue when we depend on media. As Ernst st- said, you know, people are now looking at confirmation bias in terms of who they relate to, who their sources of news and information are. News and information are controlled by by platforms which you know run on on business uh, algorithms and, and and other revenue targets, and and so there's a challenge here that I think Canada has always tried to play an important and leading role in, in the discussion. This is a big, big nut to crack, uh, and it's vitally important. Uh, as we saw, you know, disinformation can, uh, can lead to you know, immense, immense disruption globally. Uh, and we've seen that ongoing uh, all the way to, to the, the, the insurrection on Capitol Hill. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So it's, this is, you know, we, we have a huge challenge ahead of us. Uh, and I think I'd like to see Canada continue to step up uh, and show itself to be, you know, an, an opportunity to lead in this conversation around what, what does, what do we look like in a post-factual world? Uh, fantastic. And, and, and an issue near and dear to my heart, I speak about a lot. And I think, um, you know, some hope on one hand that there's a little more awareness that maybe things aren't as we saw them, but at the same time, you know, some tremendous power that those platforms have to be able to do good algorithms for good, maybe as a theme uh, out of all of that. And with your background, taking that position. Uh, Mark Healy, over to you. What's the one thing in the next 12 to 24 months? I'm going to try and get this all in. We got three minutes to go. Let me me offer it from this perspective, Peter. I mean, there there are two parts to this. You've got, uh, you've got the roles and responsibilities of government, and then you've got the responsibilities of, uh, of the public. And I'll say this, uh, it, is, it is unwise to think that government, especially elected government, politicians, will act in the interest of the country as a whole. That's unwise and un- it's immature and unrealistic. They are politicians, they cater to their base, and they cater to their parties, and they will never change that, especially uh, when you look at how politicians act, and that's universal. We're now in a country right now where we're asking uh, politicians to think about that globally, and I I think we're getting, it's okay that way. You're still seeing some partisanship in the legislatures and in the House of Commons, and I think we have to address that, and people need to see that for what it is. But at the end of the day, the government the bureaucrats in this country are doing an extraordinary job at the national level, at the provincial levels, and they are uh, they should be committed for what they're doing. At the same time, if you're looking at what should the, the greater public or, or citizens do, they should create awareness about issues. They think automatically that if because they've got some uh, great technology or some great product or service that everybody should know about it. If they don't, that's their fault. And I think we need to create more, uh, 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 more resonance from that perspective. And we've seen that done. And you and Bruce should take a lot of credit for what you did with WTF. I'll just say that. Well, thanks. Uh, whatever it takes, I guess, and get it done. Bruce Croxon, Croxon, what are you watching that you think will have the biggest impact in the next 12 to 24 months? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm watching Kirsten's issue extremely carefully, but I feel like she's got it. So I'm going to move on from that. Cause I think, I think that's the, I, I actually think that's the issue. I actually think that's the issue of our times. It's the most dangerous issue of my, of our time. I've been saying it for five years. I think we're doing, we're starting to like pay attention. So for me now, it's like, listen, we've created some leverage and some momentum under some very trying circumstances on the small business front in this country. And it would be an absolute shame to get to have anything get in the way of that momentum. So I'm looking carefully at the policies as they are, are, are uh, pertaining to carbon, our place in climate change, where we are on that factor, the keystone issue, and the taxation taxation issue. I, I think we should be doing everything we can to support the momentum right now. This would not be the time uh, to start to inhibit uh, what has been an incredible groundswell uh, and, and accomplishment, maybe particularly in the tech sector, but there's not too many industries that aren't being affected by that sector right now. Again, speaking uh, selfishly, I think I think that holds the key to us moving forward uh, prosperly, prosper, with prosperity 
and 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 keep getting rid of this gap we have between the people that have a lot and the people that don't have enough because that's in nobody's interest nobody's interest to have that gap widen anymore thanks peter thank you bruce that was fantastic and true to the theme of today's conference and uh, what bashir hope would happen some collaboration played out right in front of you there between bruce and kirsten that gives me a lot of confidence uh, and i think all of us have tried to land on this issue of of, of, of collaboration for, for the good. Um, it was a great provocative discussion. We're gonna go a little over here just for a, a quick minute summary. Uh, and I appreciate uh, all of the panelists taking their time out today. Uh, these are all very busy people who have a lot to deal with each day, especially at times like this. And, and I'm certainly deeply appreciative of their commitment to come here today and share their thoughts with you. Uh, thank you to all of you, uh, Ernest, Bruce, uh, Kirsten, and, and to Mark, of course, um, you know, speaking to government and, and business, not, not much more important to me these days than that. And the intersection of that in media, something to pay attention to. Um, I, I talked in an earlier session about the gray space and how I defined that, you know, that, that this place out beyond the horizon where real opportunity and real possibility exists. Um, it, it takes patience, endurance, a lot of commitment to identify what the gray space is. Uh, to acknowledge that it is in fact an opportunity for those classic uh, half full folks that uh, start businesses and run them and equally for the, the, the mental health challenges that come along disproportionately to people who try to do things that seem impossible, but to commit to building toward that gray space. Uh, in, in Canada, we're, we're remarkably good at seeing and, and building toward that gray space beyond the horizon. Uh, and, and as a country in, in many ways of, you know, less than 40 million people with a, a, a vast um, country east to west and, and two languages and multiple cultures with um, issues that go back hundreds and even thousands of years that are still on the table that require more collaboration. But it's always been our secret sauce here in Canada, collaboration is, and, and particularly in a world that feels so chaotic and troubled. It's the people who see the opportunity beyond the here and now and start building something incredible that inspires me. Uh, Canada is that kind of place. Uh, and it demands that the people on this panel today and the people watching band together, collaborate together and see it through. Gray space opportunities as we call them, like building the second largest country in the world as we did, requires endurance, passion, commitment, and most of all, and to today's theme, collaboration. Thank you all for participating today. Sorry to go a few minutes over there, Bashir, and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you to all the panelists. Have a great day. No problem. It was a, a fabulous discussion. Um, and Peter, you did a super job, as did Mark Kelly, Kirsten, thank you very much. I, I know with the time difference, we've been waking you up early and all that. So it was fantastic. Thanks very much. Truly appreciate that. And for the people um, who are watching, we're going to take a lunch break. Uh, and the good news is that we have we are recording all this and it will be available on our website um, in the next couple of days. So don't worry, because I think the type of discussion that just occurred, you want to hear it again and we'll make sure that that's available to you. So um, as uh, we now Take, uh, let me just uh, make sure that, um, so we're gonna shorten the lunch break by by a few minutes. Uh, it was supposed to be 25 minutes. We're gonna start sharp at 1.05 to um, when we'll start with the micro learning, which I think you want to, this is the one, the true initiative where we'll talk about it. At uh, 1.05, we'll, I'll get the session up and running two, three minutes before. so. Nobody needs to disconnect, you can stay there, but if you're on the panel, make sure that your camera is turned off, audio is turned off and right click on your video and hide yourself so that if your panel is not occurring at the time, you're not on the thing. So thanks very much, take a quick break to get coffee or whatever quick sandwich that you wanna do and we'll get cracking. I'll play another video we recorded uh, here.